So this morning, uh, we are going to continue the series that we've been in, um, Shake the Earth, Revival and Awakening. And uh, today is part four, and the title of today's message is God is Doing a New Thing. God is Doing a New Thing. Um, I, I want to share with you, I want to open up today's message by sharing with you something really, really fascinating uh, that, um, that God showed me. Back on February 3rd, and thank God Misty is good at journaling and writing things down when they happen, because I would have no clue when these things happen, but it's really remarkable how God just supernaturally speaks um, to you and, and me and speaks supernaturally to his people to show us uh, what he's doing and to show us things to come. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, when, when Jesus left, um, Scripture says that he left gifts to the church. He gave gifts to the church. And so there are multiple gifts that um, by God's power, he gives you and I so that we can do the work of ministry. That's our assignment for being here on this planet. Um, it, it's, it, it's to use the gifts that he's given us to do the work, to put our hands to the plow and do what God has called us to do. Now, my gifts might be different than your gifts. Your gifts might be different than mine, but we all have gifts. Every single one of us in this room, all of you watching online today, we all have spiritual gifts that God has given us. And the second you say yes to Jesus is the second the clock starts ticking and God says, all right, you're called to be a steward. You're called to exhaust every resource I've given you from now until the time I return or you breathe your last breath to fulfill the mission that I've given you for being on this planet. No pressure. <laughs> and so having said that, um, God speaks to me a lot through visions and dreams. This isn't a cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs kind of thing. Um, this is a, a real gift. You can read about it. Um, you read about it in the book of Joel chapter 2. He says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he's going to give dreams and visions to his people. And uh, so this is a very common thing that God does with me. He may not do that with you, but he does with me. And I, he does it with many people. Um, but one particular evening... Uh, February 3rd, I had a very, very unique dream, and I want to share it with you today um, because I feel like it's really relevant for, with, for what God is doing in his church, what he's doing around the world, and ultimately that boils down to what he's doing in your life as the church, okay? So in this dream, I saw myself in a, a large sanctuary, much, much larger than this sanctuary, and it was just full of people. And um, the, as I looked around kind of like at the, the, the walls and the, the, the paint on the walls and the decorations and everything, everything was very, very dated. The whole place felt very, very cold and very dry and very stale, if you will. All the seats were packed. And we were there. But mountain movers made up this little bitty section, all right, in the midst of a large crowd. And I was standing in the middle of our set. It kind of felt like C3 a little bit, but not so much, all right? And you'll, you'll know why here in a moment. But I'm standing in the middle of, of our section, if you will, and I start making my way up kind of around the stage. The place was so full of people, there was actually people sitting on the stage around the back wall. And so I walk up around the back, and this is still Mountain Movers people, and we're kind of sitting on the stage. <clears throat> and I walked up to the, to the back of the stage, and I'm looking ahead of me, and there's a large group of uh, what I believe um, was all young people in this vision. I couldn't see their faces, couldn't see any of their faces. I just saw the backsides of all of them. There's a large group of them, maybe 40 or 50 of them, all just, just jumbled together in a big group. And I, I noticed something very strange. I only recognized one of the young people from the backside. I just knew who he was. And I know him very well. But I didn't recognize any of the other young people. But what I noticed about this young man is that he was, he was on the stage. And this group was ministering. But he was filthy dirty. I mean, he was had his hat on and... Looked like he'd been working in a ditch all day, just covered in filth. His face was dirty. His hands were dirty, you know. And then from his waist down, you're going to think this is humorous. You'll understand what it means in a moment. But from the waist down, he was 
birthday suit naked, buck naked, from the waist down. And when I noticed this, I became very alarmed for him because I don't think he realized that he was naked. And his mom happened to be sitting on the stage in this group of people. And I turned to her to get her attention. I said, hey, go, go. I don't think he realizes, but he didn't have any pants on. Go get his attention. Go let him know what's going on. Because I was trying to help him to realize this before everybody else realized. Nobody else realized what was happening. And so while I'm trying to get her attention, I hear this commotion in the crowd And it was too late. I saw uh, who in the dream, I I just knew was the pastor of this congregation. And he was, um, he was, uh, he was very angry. And he was heading like just making a straight line for the stage and with uh, vengeance. I mean, this dude, he was angry. You could just see all over him uh, just this judgment and this criticism and just this, this really, just a really off spirit. I just knew in my heart and in the dream that this pastor is not, he's not walking with God. The guy is off. All right. You've never met any pastors like that. Have you? This guy was off. And uh, in fact, his hair was, was slicked back. He was wearing this suit and this tie. And he was so just, you could just sense he was so pious and so proud and so just felt like he was really better and that his people were better than everybody else and he was I knew in my in the dream that he was making his way up to the stage to just verbally dismantle this young man and to to correct him and to let him know he had no business ministering the gospel he had no business using his gifts for God because he was covered in dirt and he was naked all right and all of a sudden and and, and here's the deal I know this young man, and I know his heart, and I knew that this young man was carrying with him, as a lot of young people do, some really poor decisions, some regrets for things that they've done, things they've dabbled in, people they've associated with, you know, decisions that they've made, and they carry around this this guilt, and then the nakedness represents shame. And I realized that he was carrying shame and he was carrying guilt, but in his heart of hearts, he really wanted more than anything to do, so, to do something for God, to do something big for God. But this, <clears throat> this, this so-called pastor was, was, was on his way to just tear this kid apart, to let him know he had no business being used by God. And so in the dream, I got really holy anger mad. Okay, that's a real thing. Uh, you can get really, really angry for Jesus, all right? And I I was making my way to this pastor, and right before I got to him, I held my hand up, and I said, hey, it's okay. I said, he's he's with me. It's okay. And he looked at me with this scowl in his eyes, and he said, I should have known he was with you. He said, that doesn't surprise me. He said, you know what? He said, I'll deal with you when I'm done dealing with him, with the young man. And so um, I began to uh, make my way. Uh, to have a a holy come to Jesus meeting with this pastor face to face. And I was making my way to him. And just right when I got up in his face, I hear this woman behind me sitting in a chair. I'm in a crowd of people. And I see this woman sitting. I, I hear her behind me cackling like a witch. I won't tell you who it sounded like, but there is, uh, there, there is a similar cackle that I hear a lot. Um, Uh, on TV nowadays. I'm not going to tell you who I'm thinking of, but it is a very annoying cackle that I hear. And it's almost like a witch cackle. And I, I turned to her and, and, and she was just, I mean, hysterically beside herself that I had just been scolded by this pastor. And, um, and so I turned to her and I said, I'll deal with you when I'm done dealing with him. And she just kept laughing and immediately I knew I can't delay. I need to take care of this situation because clearly she's demon possessed. So I, I, I pointed at her and I said, come out of her in Jesus name. Boom. And she just fell lifeless. She just fell completely lifeless, just limp and just the demons left her and she was just lifeless in her chair. And then I woke up and, um, and I, as 
happens many times after God gives me a, a dream, he begins, you know, just boom, 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 like the, the interpretation of all these different symbolisms, you know, came to me. And um, I, I realized right away, I said, God, I said, why, why are we in a large sanctuary? What, what was that? Was that a particular place? He said, no. He said, that's the church abroad, just around the world. That's the church of today. And he said that the young people that are on that stage represents a generation, Generation Z, that I'm going to use in a mighty way. I'm going to pour out my spirit on this generation. And I'm going to use them as a catalyst to allow my spirit to be uh, poured out all around the earth in these last days. I'm going to use them. I'm going to use students that never would ever feel worthy of being used. They carry shame. They carry guilt. They carry past decisions that they've made and they just feel like they're not worthy of being used by me. Many of them are dealing with depression and anxiety and they're dealing with suicidal thoughts. They're dealing with all, all this. They've been through so much. He said, I'm going to use the most broken generation alive on the planet today. I'm going to use the most broken generation and I'm going to pour out my spirit on them to be a catalyst to lead the way. But as my spirit is moving through the church and I begin to shake the earth, there are going to be many, many, many critics in the church, if you will. Their hearts are not right with me. He said that they are, they are just like the Pharisees. It's a Pharisee spirit of, of religion. They, they will look at people and they will cast judgment and they will criticize others in the church for the way they minister. They'll criticize the younger generation for the way they minister. They will criticize the move of the Holy Spirit. They will give their critique and their opinions on revival and on awakening and all these things. And he said... Um, and, and so he said, but I'm, I'm going to use that generation in a big way. And uh, even to the point, you know, that the, the, the judgment and the criticism and the evil spirit moving even through the church of today, you know, just the fact that that, um, that woman was filled with, with demons. You just think about the influence that Satan has even in the church of today. I'm, I don't have time to really get into this, but you just think about how so such a large portion of the church is calling things that are evil good and, and things that are good, they're calling evil. And there's so much confusion and there's, there's so much um, d division in, in uh, what God's word says for today and so much criticism and so much pride. And it's just, it, we're not unified. And, um, and so I, I you know, as the Lord, you know, showed me this, that was on February 3rd. And so my heart's stirring and I'm like, man, God, you're, you're, you're doing this. Like you're going to, you're going to shake the earth in a big way. And you're going to use this generation. That was February 3rd. What day did Asbury happen? February 8th. February 8th. So five days later, Asbury happened and we see, um, God pour out his spirit, um, at Asbury university where all these students, Gen Z, man, they're going after God with all their heart. And, and it went on and on and on. But not only was it happening there, but it was happening actually, it was happening in other college campuses. And I want to show you, uh, I want to show you an example of all the different colleges that kind of simultaneously caught this fire of God, if you will, at the same time. Let me show a graphic. These, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is many of the colleges and universities all over the country that are seeing these crazy moves of God's outpouring among Gen Z. Just absolutely incredible. Look at, look at all those colleges, even Texas A&M. This blows me away. College Station, Corpus Christi. You're seeing Baylor University. Some of, these, some of these universities, you would never expect there to be a big outpouring of God's presence being secular universities. But God has moved on the hearts of this generation like we've never seen. Not in my day. Have we seen God do this in such an incredible way? But we're talking about Gen Z today. And I, I, I want to bring this to your attention because I want you to know who they are. These are those students that were born between 97 and 2012. They would be about anywhere from 11 to 26 years old right now. Talking about that generation God wants to use in a big way. And this isn't the first time God has done this. If you've seen the movie Jesus Revolution, that's exactly what he did back in the late 60s and early 70s is he used this young generation and put a hunger in their hearts to want the real thing, the real God that we, that we read about and that we preach about. And so this isn't the first time this has happened. I just think it's so interesting that God is choosing to use this generation 
for such a time as this. Billy Graham's daughter said this in an interview after her nephew visited Asbury and witnessed this, Christ being honored, God being glorified, the spirit at liberty. Mrs. Graham posed this question. Could what happened to my nephew, John Paul, be the beginning of the latter reign? An outpouring of God's spirit in one last great awakening before Jesus returns. Lord God, let it be so for the glory of your great name, for the salvation of our nation, for the revival of our people. That has to be our prayer. Is that God would do this because I don't know, I don't know what you think, but I think Jesus is coming back really soon. And I believe that he is going to use us and he's going to use the Gen Zers to shake the earth in a big way so that many people will come to Christ right before he returns. <clears throat> Not too long ago, this was before this dream, God just randomly spoke to my heart one day. He said, I'm raising up a John the Baptist generation. I said, you are? What's that? And he said, well, what did John the Baptist do? And I said, he, he prepared the, the, the people for the promised arrival of the Messiah, right? He prepared the way. John 1 and 23 says, I am the voice. This is John saying this. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And this was a reference from the book of Isaiah because Isaiah prophesied that John the Baptist would have this ministry of pre preparing the way of the Lord. So what I want you to understand is that you have the privilege of living in the day and the time, these last days, where Jesus is going to use us, his church, to shake the earth. To help people, to prepare the way of the Lord, to be that John the Baptist uh, um, um, spirit, if you will, that he would use us to, to announce and proclaim to those who are bound by chains in hopelessness and despair, those who don't know Jesus. He's going to use us, those of us who are alive in his church today, to proclaim that Jesus is coming soon. And he's going to use the Gen Z generation to go before us and to lead the way, to prepare the way. <clears throat> and so I just want to say very, very quickly that if you are part of that generation, I want to encourage you today. I just want to tell you that it doesn't matter what you think you see in the mirror. It doesn't matter uh, what people say about you. I want you to know that God has chosen you. He has chosen you for such a time as this to do something way bigger than what you could ever imagine or think. I love what Paul said in Timothy, 1 Timothy 4 and 12. He said this. He said, Timothy, don't let anyone despise you because of your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And I would tell you the same thing today. Be an example. Don't discount who you're called to be in Christ. And, and us as the church, those of us that are even not in that generation, we're still in this. They're, they're just, God's just going to use them in a magnified way. We're still in this. And our job is to come around behind them and not be like that pastor, but to come behind these young people and say, go, 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 go. Be hungry for God. Love God with all your heart. Go after God with all your heart. And, and just be an example. Be an example and don't give anybody any reason to say anything different about you. I can't wait to see. I mean, what God's doing now blows my mind, but, but it, guys, it's coming. You know they've rented out OU Stadium. Talking about Gaylord Memorial Stadium has been rented out. The date is April 29th. Is that right? April 29th. They've rented out the stadium. It's going to be a student-led prayer service at OU. Can you believe that? We're talking about tens of thousands of students gathering together to go after God. God's doing this with or without us. And I choose to jump in the game and be a part of what God is doing. We're going to close this morning with Isaiah uh, chapter 43, verse 18 and 19. It says this, but forget all that. What does he mean? You can't read a scripture and not understand what was coming before it. So let me tell you. God says, forget all that. Right before this, he had laid out all the miracles that he had done, or not all of them, but a portion of them that he had done with the children of Israel. So you read where he said, you know, I parted the Red Sea and you walked across on dry land. I gave you manna from heaven for 40 years. But then he literally says, but forget all that. And I think to myself, when I read a passage like that, why would you say that? Like, you want me to forget all those huge miracles that you did? But check this out. He says, forget all that. 
It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I am about to do something new. Say new. I'm about to do something new. I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. You know what grows in the wasteland? Nothing. Nothing in the wasteland. But here's the promise that God is going to take those things where nothing is growing, where there's no fruit, where it's nothing but devastation, where dead things are. And God said, I'm going to turn that all around. I'm going to allow my spirit to come through like a river and I'm going to revive it and I'm going to bring life. And we're talking about a generation right now, Gen Z, that God is about to use in this morning as Brad and I were doing our tech run literally early. The band's here and my daughter, who's 18, one of our girls, she heard us and she said, Gen Z, that's us. I said, yeah. She said, mom, that's the last letter in the alphabet. I said, girl, do you know what you just said? She said, Jesus is coming back. I said, yeah, he is. He's coming back and he's choosing to use the final generation. I don't know if you're as excited on the inside because your face isn't showing it this morning, but listen to me. God is choosing to raise up a generation that's been hurt, that is hopeless and helpless, that don't feel like they have the right to stand on this stage because they're not perfect and they haven't been perfect. And God is saying, I'm going to raise up the generation that nobody believes in, the generation that people are writing off. I'm going to raise them up and I'm going to use them in a mighty way because he's all about doing things that nobody would expect. You want to know why Mountain Movers is right here? Because nobody in their right mind would plant a church across from the Buffalo in outside of Tiff City, Missouri. Nobody would do it. But God. But God. Let me tell you today that, you know, on this stage, as they led worship this morning, the majority of the people on this stage are Gen Z. Brad and I didn't even think about it. As we've raised up students over the years, that's just what we do. We see these kids with talent, and we put them up, and we put them into positions. You can go in any zone in this whole church, guys, any zone, and you will see Gen Z and kids even younger than that leading. Why? Because there's a group of people that believe in them. And I want to challenge you today to realize that God wants to do something new and he'll do it with or without you. But you can get on board. You can get behind those Gen Z. You can encourage them. You can challenge them. You can rally them. Yeah, they've messed up. Yes, they've made mistakes. But guess what? So have you. And so have I. We can all look back in our past and wish we could take that eraser and say, you know, that moment right there in my life, I wish I could just do away with it. But the fact is, in God's eyes, you can. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why he said, you're forgiven as far as the east is from the west. I will not remember it, but throw it in the sea of forgetfulness. God doesn't remember the junk that you've been forgiven for. You do. And the enemy is the one bringing it up. He's the one trying to put the guilt and the shame on your life. Not God the Father. Not Jesus. He's standing next to his father's throne and he's crying out and he's challenging you and he's rallying you and guys that's what the church has to do today we are going to see a move of God like we have never seen before it's time for us to get on board amen I wish y'all could have been here uh, Friday night Friday night was unite night where accelerate gathered together really just for the express purpose of going after God. I mean, there was games and there was food and all that, but the, but the main idea for the whole night was to just worship God, a night of worship. And I mean to tell you, guys, like when you get the privilege of being able to see st- students from this perspective, facing them as they're worshiping and just realizing, just I mean, seeing, you know, I'm talking like senior and high school male athletes just bent over, just just tears just draining off of their eyes just wiping the tears and just watching God move on these students seeing them hungry for God praying for one another encouraging one another loving one another guys it is absolutely absolutely blows my mind what God is doing with accelerate and what he is doing with this generation I'm just telling you right now it it, God because you don't get the privilege of being able to see it but I'm telling you it's happening here in this church, we have the most incredible students you could ever imagine, and they love God. And you know what? They're bringing their friends. How many, how many uh, VIPs? 20 VIPs on Friday night came. I saw some students that I've seen at basketball games. I know they don't go to church, and I got to see them in the presence of God, hands lifted high. And I'm like, they know. I know they don't know what's going on, but I also know by the look on their face that they liked it, and they wanted more of it. 
I love seeing God move on the hearts of young people and seeing them get it. It's wonderful what God is. I just want you to know, because you're not in Accelerate and you don't get to see it, but I'm telling you, God is doing a beautiful thing with the young people of this church, and we are going to get so many hurting students from around this region. We're going to bring them in, and we're going to lead them to Jesus Christ, and we're going to train them and release them and do it all over again. I'm just telling you, God's doing it. So I just want to pray today as we conclude today's service, if you'll join me. Father, we are so grateful that we get to be a part of the most incredible move of God in my entire lifetime. God, the, the, the very things that we're seeing, God, are things that we have prayed for for, for for decades to be able to see you move the way that you're moving. And God, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you, God, for trusting this church, for trusting each of us, God, with all of our giftings to be obedient and to in sacrifice and submission and surrender, God, to just to do what you've called us to do in winning the lost for Christ. I thank you, God, for the young people of this church, for Accelerate, and for this Gen Z generation. God, I thank you, God, that you're using them to lead the way, God. But I pray that the rest of us wouldn't sit on the sidelines, God. I pray that we would get fully engaged in the game. I pray, God, for every one of us, those watching online, those in the room, God, that we would have a true heart of hunger, God, to personally uh, be in love with you, more than we were the first day we met you, God. And to just be so madly in love with Jesus that it would be contagious and that people would want what we have and that your power would, would flow through us as we leave this place today. And God, that we would just begin to shake the earth at work and shake the earth at school and shake the earth at the grocery store. Wherever we go, whatever we do, God, I just pray that people would know that you're Jesus, that Jesus is real and that you're living inside of our hearts, God. Each and every day. God, we love you so much. Do something new in us. Do it today. Thank you, Father. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you. You might be watching online. You might be in this, in this room today. But my question is simply this. Have you made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? What does that mean? Have you asked God to forgive you of your sins? Because you and I are both sinners. And our sin separates, sin separates, sin separates us from God. So there has to come a moment in our life where we say, God, I want to be made right with you. And I'm asking you to forgive me because I've sinned against you and against your word and against your standard. So forgive me, God. And you need to believe with all your heart that Jesus truly is the son of God because he's the only way to get to the father. That's what he said. And it's about confessing Jesus as Lord. He says, if you confess him, confess him, then he'll be the Lord of your life. If you just make that decision in your heart today. So we're going to pray a prayer. If you're making that decision today, no one's looking around, but would you just raise your hand if you're making that decision? Or if you're watching online, would you just comment all in in the comment section below? And let's pray this prayer today in support of those that are making this incredible life-changing decision. Father, I pray that you would forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse my heart. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Help me, God, to live for you. Help me to be hungry for you. Help me to be in love with you more and more each and every day as you do a new thing in me, in Jesus' name.